What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Schmozone podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by the Schmozone, the Schmozone merch. Go to the Schmozone.com, get yourself a cool Schmozone t shirt. You won't be disappointed. And while you're at it, get yourself the Schmo hand sewed mask right here. Everybody has to wear masks, they're mandated in public. Uh, guess what? Hand sewed here in the beautiful state of California. You won't be disappointed with this, too. Check it out. Let's start the show. Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to the Schmo Zone podcast, episode 30. I'm Dave Schmolenson, a.k.a. The Schmo. My co-host is... I'm Helen E. Sports. And today's guest is none other than the number 10 featherweight in the world, 50K <laughs> Dynamite, Dan E.K., a man of many nicknames. Which one yeah. do you prefer? The Animal, 50K, uh, Dynamite, it's whatever you guys... You know, I judge it off my, my friendship level. Like, if you know me as Animal, you're my OG friend. Dynamite, it's like you're kind of... Just got into the UFC. You're a casual fan. 50K. That's uh, you know, that's all my new fan base. My that's my name going forward. 50K Ige. It rhymes. It flows. But I don't know. I think it's a curse because every every since I, you know, adapted that nip, nickname, um, I've never gotten a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you got it yeah. in the first place. Yeah. 50K because yeah. the way you fight, your style. Yeah. Worthy of 50K fight bonus. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. That's kind of my, you know, why. I came up with that nickname was because that's the way I go out and fight. You know, I always put it on the line. I always try to go out and, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's fighting or anything in life. It's just kind of going the extra mile, whatever you can do to get a bonus in life or in a fight. So that's kind of the, the nickname origin. Nicknames given, not earned or earned, not given. How, what's the philosophy there? Because everybody uh, always varies. I don't know. Like, for example, Dynamite, that was kind of like forced. Or, I, you know, 50K might be forced too, but I feel like it, you got to earn it. You know, it just comes a part of you. Like Danimal, that, that was my first ever fight nickname, but that's just who I was. Everyone called me Danimal, whether it was in the gym or outside the gym, I was Danimal. Um, so 50K, I, I guess it was, it was an earned nickname. But I have to add, before we talk more about the fights, happy yeah. belated birthday. Oh, thank you so much. August 6th. 29th. I know you're ten days older than me. Oh no way! Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you do anything fun? Um, I went out to Tahoe with my wife, so it was kind of nice, a little decompression from the fight. Um, back in July, we went out to Tahoe for like eight, eight or nine days, and I uh, just got away, got some fresh air, went mountain biking, um, went on the lake. It was super nice. I love it up there, actually. Yeah. Hey, you bike too. Well, not mountain bike, but <laughs> yeah. just like kind of uh, triathlon, like biking and stuff oh, like nice. that. That type nice. of stuff. Very yeah. different bike. Yeah, yeah. Very different style. No, cycling's. Uh, I like mountain biking because it's a workout, but you're not thinking of it like a workout. I guess cycling could be that way too, if you just kind of get in the zone and ride 100%. into the sunset. Right. Exactly, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. It's fun being on yeah. two wheels that move faster than you can yeah. with your two feet, right? Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. It definitely works that way. Yeah. So you live out here in Vegas. Yep. This is where all the fights are happening. Yeah. If they're not overseas in Fight Island, mm -hmm. it seems to be the hub. You train yeah. not far from us, down yeah. the street over Super Extreme close, Couture. Yeah. yeah. I feel like Extreme Couture has kind of made itself like a hub during this pandemic. And even leading yeah. up to this pandemic, a lot of different fighters and coaches are coming there when yeah. they're not getting work at the PI. I mean, just look at the staff, people like Coach Eric Nixick. Yeah. Uh, a big teddy bear like they're yeah. so welcoming and warm individuals kind of what has been the atmosphere like at extreme couture uh during this pandemic and right now yeah it's definitely on fire right now you know you guys nailed it like this is the place to be right now with all the fights happening in vegas like it's crazy i've i've lived in vegas but i've never fought in vegas well actually once for the contender i series. know i was gonna bring that but up like, too no like real you know mm -hmm. ufc or whatever but um yeah, right now it's it's the place to be because there's so much there's fights every week and there's guys falling out every single week. You, we see it every week. I was actually, you know, someone fell out. I was going to fight actually this Saturday. You know, it was a good opportunity. Um 
Ricardo Lamas lost his opponent against Ryan Hall, and I, I sparred on Thursday. I was like, hey, I feel pretty good. So I hit up Sean. I was like, hey, you know, if you need a guy, I'm here in Vegas. But they went a different route. You know, it's for the better, you know, for him. Were you too late, and they already had an opponent, or he just wanted somebody else? No, um, he had he had options. So they thought about it for about a day. Um, it would have been a hell of a fight to get back into the top 15. And for me, it's like, it's a risk, too. You know, he's not ranked and to go into a fight not 100% prepared, you know, just based off a of feeling, you know, it's a big opportunity. You know, it does good on as far as my relationship with the UFC, as far as stepping up and, you know, contract things and whatnot. Like, that's, it works out on that part. But as far as being physically 100%, maybe not the best, but it's also, you know, it's an opportunity for me to go and, you know, take out a former title challenger. So that was uh, kind of how I was looking at it. Well, was there someone that they presented to maybe for Fight Island or? No, honestly, after my last fight with Calvin, I wasn't planning on taking a fight anytime soon because I was five fights in a year. Um, I was really going to just take some time to focus on my technique and just grow as a fighter, you know, as an athlete and then take it slow. But then... I don't know. I'm crazy, too. Yeah, even just the last two <laughs> fights, and you just mentioned you're not 100%. I wonder where you, you stand, because that was a war with Edson yes. Barboza yeah. and then a war with Calvin Cater. Yeah. Uh, Barboza was in Jacksonville, and Cater was over in yeah. Fight Island. Uh, two very, very tough yeah. opponents. I mean, there's a reason why you're ranked number 10 in the world. For sure. Uh, where's your body at right now? My, my body's act honestly pretty healthy. Um, I try to you know, maintain a healthy relationship with my lifestyle pretty much year round. Um, I always eat pretty good, sleep good, focus on my recovery, do my stretching, my mobility, you know, everything I, I should be doing as a martial artist. So, you know, thank God I haven't had any serious injuries, no surgeries. So I always stay healthy, but I think it's just more so like the face damage. I always take face damage. So it's like kind of not like forcing myself not to go in the gym and spar. Like I could still wrestle, grapple, you know, do everything, hit pads and run and lift. But, you know, I think it was just straying away from the sparring a little bit. And uh, that's helped for sure. Just kind of, yeah. How many stitches did you have to get under your right eye? Uh, so I've cut this eye. Actually, in this fight, it wasn't that many. It wasn't a deep cut. Mm -hmm. um, it just sw swelled up bad. I hit an elbow, like, directly in the eye socket. And my eye blew up um, in that fifth round, actually. If that didn't happen, my face wouldn't have been too bad. <laughs> from the fight but um yeah i think i got like seven stitches but i've had like nine in there before from a previous cut and then i knew one day it would open up yeah yeah i mean i've had that same area i have seven stitches i was 18 years old took an elbow from playing basketball but you wouldn't even notice it okay. and it only happened once never opened up yeah. again and something like that man <laughs> it's just i feel like that area it's sensitive yeah. it could easily open up again yeah definitely it happened when i was uh Actually, the first cut happened, I was drilling with Ali. You know, he's kind of got that, like, pointy head shape. So he <laughs> did a judo throw, and, and uh, his head smacked my face. And I have it on video. I got to find it sometime. But um, cut open. I let it heal. Went back to sparring maybe, like, three weeks later. Uh, I was sparring um, Boston Salmon, and he hit me with a <laughs> solid right hook, and it just busted open again. And that was the last time it opened since the fight, but... Low key, Boston Salmon, one of the best names in MMA, <laughs> it has to be. Yeah. Boston Salmon, like fish yeah. and just, yeah, just a great solid. Incredibly name. skilled fighter too. Just had some bad luck, you know. Yeah. In his last few fights, but even in his last one, like he won, but it was bad luck, you know. It's sad to watch, but you know I love that kid and incredible talent. And I wanted to add though. Ali seems like such a great fighter. I yeah. always see like his pose, right? Yeah, honestly, he's like, he he's he, his mind's all over the place, but he's he's a really good coach. Like he's actually a really good coach as far as clinch work, ground and pound, you know, transitions, um, cage stuff. Um, he works a lot of stuff with Khabib, Frankie, so like a lot of that Dagestani stuff. Um, that I've actually incorporated into my game. You know, it's all damage based and position. So I, 
Uh, he's actually a really good coach. Jack of many traits, former yeah. professional fighter, yeah. like coaching and yeah. training with you guys, and yeah. obviously managing yeah. a lot of different people too. And I yeah. wanted to ask you about the dynamics of the relationship because you work for Ali, but you're represented by Brian Butler and Sucker Punch. Yeah. How does that dynamics work? I guess it would be a conflict if Ali managed me because that's not really making my life easier. I, it's great, you know. It's uh, you know, I I get so much experience getting to you know, see one of the best managers in the world, you know, at his craft every single day and then get to surround myself with guys like Khabib, Justin Gagey, Frank Yeager, Cody Garbrandt, Kelvin Gastelum, Kamar Usman, Henry Suhud, all these guys and like be around them fight week if I'm not fighting, obviously, and like, you know, see the business side of things and like, you know, taking the right fights and like, Kind of helps me actually when I when it's time for me to fight. It's just it's so much easier because it takes out all the guesswork. Like I'm not worried about anything and know I'm doing the right thing too. It's like you get the best of both worlds because as you are coming up as a fighter, you're you're very hands on with a lot of Ali's guys and probably yeah. still are too. Yeah. Um. And just you get the best of both worlds, being and and seeing both dynamics of everything. Yeah. So like when I moved to Vegas, I was two and one. I didn't really have anything and that's when i met ollie so i was just kind of the guy and um i you know i i felt like i had to prove myself so i would run around i was i was the jack of all trades i did everything i was the guy running errands getting groceries like the bag boy you know jump into training jump out of training get back to like texting and working and i had no schedule like it was just all day that was my lifestyle who was so. the most needy ollie <laughs> client that you had to do be the bag boy i don't for? know i don't know there's uh there's a few, but, you know, I don't want to name names. <laughs> good sport. He's being a good sport about it. So what uh, made you decide to move to Las Vegas? Obviously for MMA, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, for, for MMA, for sure. Um, just kind of training back home, I, I guess you could say it was like half ass or not half ass. I, I was just, I was working construction full time and training and you know, the coaches back home, that's not their full-time job. They're construction workers as well or going to school or fire, whatever, you know. Back home is Hawaii. Hawaii, right? yes. Yeah. Sorry for those who don't know. I'm from Hawaii, Oahu, North Shore, Haleva, Hawaii. Um, but I uh, I just kind of came to conclusion. And I've been to Vegas a few times with Brad Tavares. He was already up here. So he kind of invited me, like, hey, come out for a couple weeks, do a camp, like three-week camp. Um, so I would come out, live on his couch do a camp, go back home, and if I had a fight. Um, but then I, I knew eventually I was going to have to make the full-time move if I wanted to take this career seriously. But it seems like it worked out okay. Seems Absolutely, to be doing you just yeah. fine. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how those ranking systems work because yesterday you were tied for 11, and then I checked this morning, <laughs> you're at 10, and I know before the Calvin Cater fight, you were 10, you're back at 10, you yeah. move up. Yeah. I don't know who's making those rankings, but you seem to yeah. be doing good, and you're still top 10. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, I, I try not to play too much into the rankings or, or let it get to my head because I tweeted yesterday the rankings are fake because Gilbert Burns tweeted something. I was like, yeah, the ranking, <laughs> rankings are fake. Um, I, You know, there's many reasons why. I mean, you guys probably see it too, but just... I don't know. I don't, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I mean, I brought it up to Dana in the interview with him. Was that last week? I'm mm -hmm. like, so Henry Cejudo and Conor McGregor are both retired, right. right? Yet Conor McGregor is still ranked. He's still a top five ranked fighter. Yet Henry Cejudo's out of the rankings completely. And I asked Dana, and he assumed it was USADA. He's, he withdrew yeah. from the USADA protocol. That would make sense. But still, if somebody's but retired. I'm pretty sure Henry's still in the... You saw the protocol. That's what I'm wondering. I think so. I, I'm true. pretty sure he is. I think I so, too. I should know that. <laughs> you should know that. And um, I also think that, because uh, I want to get into your division, too, I still think he wants to fight Alex yeah. Volkanovski. Yeah. I, I was telling him uh, um, before I went into that fight with Cater, I was like, I said, take it easy, Triple C. That's that's my guy. That's <laughs> like, let me get him first. You know, don't cut, in, don't cut in line. But he's like, no, I love you, brother. Like, just like, whatever. But... You know, it's good for him. It's good for his promotion. Henry's the best at keeping himself relevant without fighting. Like, he's always, he's very creative in that sense and articulate and keeping himself relevant. <laughs> do you think he's done? I do. I, money talks. Money talks. Yeah. I know if, my, you know, if the right money was there for the right opportunity. You know, he's young, he's healthy, and he's an athlete. He wants Volkanovski. Well, he, he can have him. 
Yeah, he can have him now. <laughs> Especially because looking at that division, there mm-hmm. is there a clear guy for Volkanovski right now? Like, let's just say Volkanovski wants to fight. He wants to book a fight. Is there a clear guy? Because he doesn't want the trilogy Max with Max Holloway yeah. Yeah. right off the bat. Is, does it make sense for Cejudo right off the bat? I mean, with the way things are going, like, Zabit and Yair were supposed to fight this Saturday. Right. But I think that would uh, establish a very clear contender. But yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. What ahead. about uh, Ortega? He's and, ranked number two. And, and he's Korean fighting zombie. Korean Zombie, yeah. finally. Yeah, finally. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I That was kind of making me frustrated, too, with the rankings. You got a guy like Ortega hasn't fought in two years. Um, but then you got guys like Cater, who's fighting active myself, who's active. I lost, so I don't... Of course, I don't deserve a title shot, but, uh, you know, we're active fighters. We're not picking and choosing our fights or sitting out on the table. But um, I don't know. That'll be a good fight, Ortega and Zombie. I'd love to see how Ortega comes back after a two-year layoff. Um, even Zombie, I don't think he's fought in over a year. I think he fought in June or, uh, last year. Yeah, why well, he fought in, didn't he fight in December as well? Um did he fight in December in, in Korea? Was his last South- fight Moicano or was it Frankie? I think it was Frankie. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, in was, Korea. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, it was Frankie. Okay, that was December then. All right. Yeah, yeah. So so, so do you think that the winner of Zabit and Yair Rodriguez is more deserving of a title shot before the winner of Zombie and Ortega? So in that case, I feel like it almost, and you've seen it many times, but it, it might come down to a performance yeah, true. Base. Like I agree. Like if Zabit goes out there and just starts his Yair, it's like oh, you can't deny the guy. But if it's like a sloppy fight and then Zombie comes in and takes out Ortega or vice versa, it's like you know, it, I feel like sometimes it comes down to that too. Like the rankings only mean so much in the top five. You know, sometimes it comes down to that performance. When you fought Edson a few times, back, you fought yeah. him on two weeks' notice. It was yeah, a very about two short and a half notice. weeks. So I got maybe eight days of training, and that's we were in quarantine. That was like the beginning of quarantine. Well, March, April, May. I was training in my garage. I didn't do any training whatsoever in the gym. So I got maybe eight days in the gym when I found out, because I and I remember Dana was coming. I was like, "Hey, if you guys want to fight this and that," and I was like, I was looking at it as opportunity maybe guys aren't in the gym maybe they're slacking off you know their body's a little weaker or not conditioned so i was looking at it as a positive like hey i'm gonna jump on it and uh just take opportunity like i was in good physical shape as far as lifting and running and doing all that stuff but i haven't sparred then eight days no eight days of training we got like maybe two or three sparring sessions and then uh yeah went and fought edson i, I don't know i blacked out i don't know that was another war too. Yeah, that was yeah. fantastic fight. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Fight. I love yeah. watching your fights. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I always know it's going to be entertaining. Fighting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you wear it uh, too. And uh, yeah. so, what? Going back to the ranking topic too, because we were talking before. I think the show started. Like, I think there's literally some media members that we haven't seen. Yeah, in well over a year, if I've even come across them at all, that are making rankings. Yeah, for this, and it's just pretty weird because. What I noticed, too, it's a lot of things are trendy, right? Because yeah. I don't think Bryce Mitchell was ranked, and now he's in the rankings, and no coincidence it was announced, or he's announced that he signed a bout agreement yesterday. I don't know if the opponents come out. It might be coming out today yeah. while we're t- having this podcast, but yeah. everything's just on timing. Yeah, it's all timing. This whole sport's yeah. about timing. Like, you can literally... When I was coming up, I was like, this is my perfect time. Like, I'm gonna, I'm coming up on a, I'm on a six-fight win streak, if I go out and take number, take out number six in the world, like I put myself right into a title mix, but didn't go go that way. But this sport's all about timing, and if you're in the right place at the right time, like anyone can become a champion on any given day, especially in this top fifteen division. Like in our division, everyone's a killer. I feel like anyone could be a champion. And you normally walk around it in the one sixties. You were talking about. Yeah, I feel like if I get. If I get to 170, I'm kind of sloppy and slow. Um, I don't look like a big guy, but I I have some mass. Like my, I use the big bones excuse, but it's true. Like I have big hands, big feet, um, long reach, long arms, short legs, short stubby legs. But um, 
yeah, so I'm kind of just dense, but I, I try to stay in the 6C5 region. Well, the workouts you do, your wife is big into CrossFit. Yes. So a lot of the Olympic lifts are really good with bone density and keeping strength yeah. and everything like that. I know you probably incorporate a yeah. lot of that into your workouts. Definitely. I, I've always been a big fan of Olympic lifting, especially for building explosiveness. And that's kind of the way I fight. I just kind of explode and yeah. look for big shots. Um, trying to get better at that, just picking my shots. But... <laughs> It's hard. <laughs> but you made your pro debut about six years ago. Um, yeah. What made you want to, you know, pursue MMA? Was this always something that you wanted to pursue when you were young? Uh, I don't know, because I started training when I was in high school. My friend, um, my friend's dad was like a purple belt or brown belt, and he's mm -hmm. fought MMA, like old school MMA. So we, we would train in his backyard, like real. Honestly, that's when I got my best, because we were just drilling arm bars arm bars like hundreds of reps like of one technique just drilling and my timing got really good and then i started competing in jujitsu as a blue belt purple belt brown belt i didn't really compete too much as a black belt because i already transitioned into fighting um but i uh yeah i did 11 amateur fights in hawaii so amateur fights in hawaii could be considered a pro fight anywhere else like we yeah, don't, that's what yeah. I heard. Yeah, it's like, and it's top level. These guys are good, and they have experienced extensive kickboxing backgrounds. And um, so I went the opposite route. Like, I had zero kickboxing or boxing. I just had, I was strong, and I could grapple and wrestle a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> Who would you say are the major influences in Hawaii in the sport of MMA? If you go back home or if the conversations you had as you're coming up in this sport, who were some of your major influences and the people that you've heard around the island? So at the time when I was coming up, it was obviously like BJ Penn, um, Brad Tavares, because I was in college. He was on the Ultimate Fighter at the time. So like I didn't even know him, actually. We trained out of the same gym back in Hawaii, but he was already here in Vegas once I started training there. Um, I actually went to one workout and he was training. That's when I first met Brad but then I went to college, I wrestled a little bit, and then uh, came back, started training. But yeah, definitely guys like Brad Tavares, BJ Penn. And then uh, once I started training as a professional, like I, I trained a little bit with Max. So Max was like one of those guys to so see. He was 4-0 when he got to the UFC, which was like super awesome. And watching his rise uh, as I was still coming up, like the, you know, the regional scene. And then other guys too, like I think... We had like Dustin Kimura. He was fighting. Um, he was in the UFC at the time. Kind of came in the same time as Max. Um, and the old school guys like Louis Smoka, still in the UFC. Russell Doan. All those guys. Yancey Medeiros. Solid guy. Super solid. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about somebody <laughs> that, uh, uh, that Sorry you're if also... I miss anybody. No, it's... Yeah. You've a lot of people right there. Yeah. And then I'll make sure they call you out on social media. <laughs> Maki Patolo, them. Puna Soriano. Coconut bombs. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Maki's fighting this weekend. Quick turnaround yeah. for him. Yeah. yeah. Quick turnaround for him. Yeah. And Puna, uh, yeah. it's very impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you this. Someone I know you're around, I've seen you around, whether because one of our friends, too, he's been on the show, uh, Will Harris, yeah. Anatomy of a Fighter. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen a, you in a lot of the videos yeah. for obvious reasons, but uh, I want to ask you about Habib. You know, this is going to be a unique situation for him fighting really for the first time without his father right there yeah. by his side in his corner, and you spent a lot of time with him. Um, I'm just wondering, just knowing his psyche and knowing where he's around, yeah. is this something that he could compartmentalize and kind of put aside when it comes to fighting, put those types of emotions aside, and you'll expect the same dominant Habib fighter? I think so. Um, he's such a solid dude. I, I know how much his father meant to him, and but I don't think he'll use he'll let that weaken his, his mind or his psyche. I think he's he's such a solid, you know, level-headed guy that he can go in there and you know maybe we'll see an, an even scarier Khabib. But uh, obviously they're both my friends, Khabib and Justin. Um, I was gonna get to so, Justin next. Yeah. Uh, like as a fan, that's an amazing fight. It's it's super interesting. You got a guy who has insane takedown defense, and I'm telling you, insane takedown defense because, like, I've trained with Justin, and this guy can he will scramble as long as he has to to not get 
taken down to keep it standing. And he's a D1 wrestler. Like, it's crazy. But um, he's a savage, and Khabib's a savage. So I don't... Like, I don't want to see it, but I want to see it as a fan. It almost seems like it's because we haven't had to see Justin's wrestling, and he's got that extensive wrestling background. It's going to be like a battle of wills, and it'll come down in a lot of events to cardio because how much is he going to stay there and defend the tank? If you think yeah. he's going to be able to scramble enough to defend the tank down, yeah. or is a Habib eventually going to hold him down to the ground like he does yeah. to everybody? Yeah. And do what he does. Yeah, it's definitely one of those fights. You know, we just have to wait and see. Um, but it will come down to to the cardio. But then it's like I've never seen Khabib get tired. I've seen Justin get tired, but he fights 110%. So he could, you know, either one of these guys could go out there and finish. I, I don't know. It's going to be pretty nuts. Well, earlier I wanted to ask you, because you brought up Frankie Edgar, yeah. what did you think of his bantamweight debut against Pedro Munoz? I thought he looked awesome. Yeah. You know, that's a, you know, I feel like he was counted out. He was the underdog, but, like, I I watched him train and, you know, just watching his drop to 135 and his body looked great and he just looked physical and his movement looked great. He never gets tired. That's a one of my favorite fighters you know, growing up, he's one of my favorite fighters. You know, took out took out our hero, our our idol, BJ Penn. So, like, you know, this guy's pretty good, and he's still on top of the world. So, um, I thought he had a great performance. It was a close fight for sure. Pedro's still pissed that yeah. uh, he lost that fight. Did you score, uh, Frankie? I did. I did. Um, and you know, it's hard to say because he was moving backwards, but it's the way Frankie fights too. He he draws guys in. He'll. Go in and out, in and out, in and out. And I fight that way too. Like I may back up, but I'm really drawing you in to land my counter shots. And it was, it was, you know, you can look at it. It depends how you score. You know, just as far as ring control, what you count as ring control. Like I count that as ring control, even if you're moving backwards, because you're, you're making the initial move to. So I don't know. Two great fighters. It was a great fight. Um, Pedro will be back stronger. You know he's a great fighter, super tough, uh, and I don't I don't doubt that doubt that guy at all. So, but yeah, as a fighter, you got to come in there sometimes. I mean, I mean, you obviously do you go in there and you have the mindset if you leave this fight up to the judges, that you will live with whatever the result is, win or loss. If you don't get the finish, yeah. whether you knock someone out, submit them, whatever it is, if you do not finish the fight. And you leave it up to the judges. You are responsible for yeah. that W or that L. Oh, most definitely. And I've been trying that every single fight. Like I never want to leave it to the judges, and that's why I make an exciting fighter. Like I'm trying to finish every guy I've fought. Kevin Aguilar I didn't finish him. I was trying to. Mirsa Bektik. I was trying to finish him. Edson. These are all like really tough guys. Like not easy to finish. Um, but if it doesn't go your way, that's just the, the you know you have to live with it and get on move on to the next one like when i fought edson a lot of people argued that edson won and you know you could see it like you know you can see both sides and maybe why he won and like i was whatever i could have easily been on the other side of that spectrum and would have had to just pick myself up and move on from that but you know even that fight like hey i was still willing to give this guy a rematch like dude i trained for you with on two weeks notice like let's fight we could fight again so admiral of you to do so i i mean the results different but when you're yeah. feeling both those guys i wanted to ask you a uh, tougher opponent for you cater or barboza or you, you can't really tell because of the two two and a half week notice with edson um edson's scarier <laughs> like that was scary like oh that's like a guy i would never want to fight like when i was growing up as a fighter like i never want to fight that guy edson barboza and then here i am standing across from him so even when I watch that fight, like, like watch myself fighting him, like I'm like in awe of myself, like oh my, I'm fighting Edson Barboza, like he's scary um, and very dangerous. Cater, I didn't, I I knew he's dangerous as well. He's a killer. He's finished four of his last guys, and you know I knew I couldn't make any mistakes, but he was tougher in the sense like he knew. I feel like he knew his range better. He was a little more methodical. Edson's kind of like plot and rip um so i knew i can pressure edson enough to where he couldn't get off and 
you know, I showed he wasn't able to land very many leg kicks, which I was terrified of. I was I did not want to get <laughs> my leg battered by Edson. Um, so I was kind of in and out, in and out, in and out, and he couldn't get my timing. Uh, but Cater, he was very methodical, slowed the fight down, was able to pick his shots, and he, you know, he was the better man that night. So, ideally for you though, when would you like to return? I'd say December. Yeah. You know, I did mention I was gonna fight maybe this Saturday, but you know that that was just a spur of the moment decision. But I would really like to come back and fight in December. I'm just really working my game right now. You know, trying to better myself in every aspect, my transitions, uh, my strength, my athleticism. Um, and I just want to make sure when I come back in December, if that's the case, that I'm a savage and no one's going to take me out. And would it be just anybody ranked above you that you'd be interested See, in? See, I don't, that's where I don't really care. Like, yeah. everyone wants to fight the guy above them. Like, I'll fight a guy below me. I'll fight mm -hmm. a guy that's not ranked. You got killers that aren't even ranked. You got guys like Cub Swanson. Like, he's a killer. He's not even ranked. You got guys like Feely. He's not even ranked. Like, these guys are killers. I think Mitchell just got into the rankings. Right. And like you said, he, he has a bout agreement sign. But it doesn't matter above me, below me. I just want to fight, and I just want to win. I feel like the wins do more talking than the rankings, if that makes sense. Like Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Because as you know, you're only as good as your next fight. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's how the system goes. So that's why I was willing to fight a guy like Lamas, you know, who's fought for the title before, but he's not ranked, but it's still a, a win over a big name if I go out there and beat him, you know. Uh, go back to when we were at Fight Island. It was a crazy time zone that we had to adjust to, uh, yeah. and we know that too. And the UFC, uh, the way the media schedule was and your fight schedule, it seemed like you had to probably balance between two different time zones. Yeah. Did you prefer... Uh, fighting overseas in Abu Dhabi versus kind of being here on the United States time? did Was um, there a major adjustment for you at all? Well, when they offered me cater, um, it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down, obviously. I don't think I would have got the main event slot here in Vegas. They needed a main event. That's why I got called on four weeks' notice. They needed a main event. Um, so I I wouldn't say I, would, I preferred that. Like, it was definitely different. Um it was super hot over there. Fighting in the morning was strange. It was like wake up at 4 a.m. and fight at 6 a.m. Like that was the weirdest thing ever. Like you don't want to fight when, I mean, maybe you do when you first get out of bed. Maybe you want to fight someone, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Did you, tr so did you train uh, at the time you were slated at fighting at? So you, your yeah. entire sleep schedule was based off of your fight yeah. time, I assume. I actually had a pretty good routine over there. I was waking up early. Had my coffee, did some breathing, like activation stuff, um, little yoga. Then I would train around 6.30, 7 a.m. And I felt pretty good. Uh, and then just kind of like we went through the whole way in. And then we had that whole day to recover. So it was like we weighed in. Then you have the whole next day to recover. So you don't really, you're not fighting that day, which is weird. And then the very next morning we fought. So you don't have that time to get like those that anxiety and nerves. And like I get anxious and nervous probably every fight, but by the time I'm at the arena, like I've, you know, I'm in the zone. But I didn't get those nerves. So you could put on. Did you put on more weight then? Probably because you had more time than mm. you normally would have. Uh, maybe a little bit. You know, like I said, I don't. I don't like to get too big either. I, I know a lot of guys that just want to get as big as possible. But I try to get to the weight where I feel good in sparring. Like, what weight do I feel good when I spar? That's the weight I'll try to be in the ring. And I know you Off fought on a uh, contender series. So, obviously, you're used to the no crowds. But what did you, you know, make of that fighting in Jacksonville and then Abu Dhabi, both no crowds? And compare that to contender series. Yeah. So, my contender series season was kind of crazy because I there were a lot of guys there that I knew, like Justin, Misha Tate, some guys from Extreme, because we're allowed to bring, they, guys were getting in. If they wanted to go to the contenders, they were getting in. So, like, I had everyone there that I knew. So it was crazy. Like, everyone was cheering for my fight. It was probably the loudest fight on the contender series. Um, but that was fun. That was a different um, experience as far as, like, everything is on the line right here. And I'm fighting for a contract because this is my, my lifelong goal and dream. And that everything was on the line. Uh, 
Jacksonville was different. I had mentally prepared because I knew there was going to be no, you know, crowd. That was weird because it was a huge arena, but not one person in there. Um, and you know how everyone was saying they hear their coaches better. I didn't hear my coaches. I think because it was Edson Barbos that had to be so in the zone. Yeah. <laughs> the schmo zone. The right? schmo zone. Was, you got to be in the zone. <laughs> I was so in the schmo zone. So um, I... Uh, that was different, and then Abu Dhabi was just an alien experience because even our locker rooms where we were warming up, like there was no roof. The roof was the arena, so it was kind of was like an alien movie. Yeah, we got a like a behind the scenes tour of it before it all started, and uh, yeah, it was like being in a giant tent and it, and having sections in this type of tent, and yeah. even your uh, the fighter meeting area, that big conference that was right next yeah. to our media section. At least the AC was working oh, pretty yeah. well. Oh yeah, yeah. I was worried about that to be honest, but yeah, it was it was working. It was on point. Uh, did you do uh, any of the race driving though when you were down there, or the jet ski? The Formula One. Cars? I didn't. Um, I actually saw Cater jet skiing. I'm like, oh, this guy's this guy's an idiot. He's in the sun. He's gonna get drained. <laughs> he's hurting. He's gonna mess up his back. But so I I just kind of quarantined myself the whole time. But I did go. I did drive those cars. Um, the last time I went to Abu Dhabi, when Khabib fought Poirier, I, uh, but I actually got to drive it. Oh, they so, let you drive it? Yeah. So That's so cool. But you were probably in Ferrari World, which wasn't open to us, or no, was it I the was, same area? I was on that same uh, Yas Marina what? That's racetrack. Cool. So I had a guy on my passenger seat uh, telling me, like, shift, shift, shift. Okay, gas, you know, pedal to the metal. All right, slow it down, down shift, make your turn. So it was kind of nuts, and it was funny because they, uh, they're like, "Hey, do you want to pay ten dollars in case you total the car?" And I was like, "Yeah, like I'll pay twenty dollars, like <laughs> if I total this million dollar Aston Martin or whatever." So ten dollars? Yeah, it was ten dollars for the insurance. What? I wow. mean, the, the value of the dollar is greater there than it is here. <laughs> so yeah. how fast did you go? It was in kilometers, so I don't oh, know. Yeah. I don't really. We still have the videos. I haven't even posted on social oh, media. I thought I was gonna. Throw I think they up went after. up to like two hundred twenty-four kilom. It was it was up to two hundred twenty-four kilometers. Does that yeah. sound right? Yeah. Yeah. It's those turns that got me. Yeah. Those turns. Yeah. Yeah. I felt a little sketchy as far like I did maybe eight laps on my own. So, but by like the sixth, seventh, and eighth lap, like I was like, okay, I can rip these turns, but I didn't trust the car enough. But then I realized like this thing can really handle like. I just have to trust it a little more. And what time of day were you going to? Because we were at night and it was still over 100 degrees plus that 100% humidity. Yeah, I went in the evening last time. So, yeah. and it was just ridiculously hot scorching hot and yeah. you mentioned uh cater on the jet skis we were we were going to the beach right there by the octagon and yeah. him and his team and his coach i remember they were running by us this was a couple days before yeah. the fight they were they were going just to jump in the water and pose in the octagon they were actually going to the octagon to get work in the octagon That's i don't think they realized that it was just like kind of um the surface wouldn't be optimal yeah. for them yeah. They didn't they didn't stay in there very long. I didn't even go to that octagon. Like my wife wanted to go cuz she came. She's like, "Let's go to the beach." I'm like, "Ah, I'm good. It's so hot." Like I walked maybe for 5 minutes outside and it was just too Trench. much. Yeah. I couldn't wear my glasses there because the second oh, you go steam. out there, it steam. Yeah. Couldn't yeah. see. Yeah. And did um Tyson and Eric Nixig become like Twitter buddies? Well, they've always been pretty good friends yeah. and it was funny because like fight week like they had a good relationship going in but then fight week it was like a weird tension like ego like i don't know both had to kind of puff their chests out but then after the fight it's like all right you know it's cool whatever yeah it seems like both you guys uh enjoy talking and being around both you guys both seem like good dudes it's not going to be something like after the fight we're going to hate each other or anything. It's just going to yeah, be mutual respect. I love respect. the sportsmanship. And after you guys all took the photo together yeah, in the octagon. That was pretty cool. I think that's like legendary. I don't think there's many photos like with both teams and together. In, in the Fight octagon. Island. In yeah. Fight Island. Super legendary. That Iconic. That was something that we both remembered. Yeah. And something we'll always take away from. Yeah. It was honestly, and I think we're going back too. Yeah. And I think that's it's going to I think yeah. it's going to be uh, that... Israel Adesanya fight card that September okay. 19th through 
Habib and Gaethje, mm-hmm. October 24th. That's yeah. six weeks. Oof. Six weeks. Yeah. We did three weeks before. This yeah. is going to be six weeks, so that's wow. going to be uh, double the amount of time. Hopefully not as hot. But no, it's still pretty hot it's in still, September. It's so close to the equator there, which you don't think about until you're you're there and you look at the map, and it's just... it's. It's it's like taking the hottest days here in Vegas and yeah. being in the hottest days in Miami. Mix yeah. the the heat with the uh, the humidity, the hot, the worst of the sauna and the steam yeah. room, and combine them. It's, speaking of Abu Dhabi, I think Hawaiians are like zero and seven in Abu Dhabi. Is that right? <laughs> like I don't know. I think that's our. I tweeted that too. Like Abu Dhabi's kryptonite for Hawaiians. <laughs> so if you're from Hawaii, you got to schedule a fight. <laughs> Just pull out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we're not. We, talk, we talked about not leaving it up to the judges, and I can't help but go back to the Volkanovski and Holloway card and scoring it and stuff like that. There's controversy with who won that fight and everything, yeah. or the second fight. That's the second <laughs> fight. I'm already talking about a third fight. Yeah. Well, we see a third fight. Is Max deserving? Because we we brought up Cejudo. If see, maybe a now is a good time. Like, yeah. All right. Sure. Like, so I don't know. Cejudo, they're talking, but like. They can do Max and Volkanovski 3 right now if, because there's no one else fighting for a while. And if these guys, once these guys do fight, like they're not going to be ready to turn around and jump into a title fight. Right. By, you know, who knows? Because, December, early next year. Because yeah. is Max fighting like Sorry. a Josh Emmett? Oh, you're good. Uh, is, yeah. is he fighting like someone like a Josh Emmett? Is like a name like that, because cause everything's name driven, rankings driven, is that going to be enough for him to get, if he gets a W? The next fight, he's going to want to be right back into title contention yeah. if he's not fighting for the title again. Yeah, I mean, you have a guy who is a champion who lost, um, you know, lost two times to the champ, but you go back and you get a win, like, you can put yourself right back into the title mix. Like, I've seen it happen. We've all seen it happen on multiple occasions. So, um, I don't know. I guess we just kind of wait and see how things play out. And, yeah. Yeah. And going back to uh, judging, do you think that there should be any changes to the judging system? Um, definitely. Mm-hmm. I, I just think you you need more experience. Like a lot of these judges, like have never trained. Like they've never fought. They've never trained. So I don't know what they're really judging. But if you get guys like maybe ex fighters or you know ex ex referees who've been in there who see everything like use these guys as, as judges i don't know what the the criteria is to be a judge but it's just a lot of them come from boxing right i think i don't know i don't even know <laughs> yeah i mean it just depends too i mean with athletic commissions it's varying state by state but yeah it seems like at least with referees a yeah. lot of them like herb, herb and mark goddard mark right? goddard for sure we've talked to both of them they have professional fighting experience yeah yeah so oh. they've they, they've seen it, they've done that, and then uh, you know I don't even know the names of some of the judges, but I guess we were in the elevator not too long ago with some judges, and I had no idea that they were judges. I'd had no yeah. idea they were affiliated yeah. with the sport of MMA until I looked at their yeah. name tag and saw UFC. Isn't there like a half blind? I don't know. <laughs> oh what? <laughs> <A> half blind? <laughs> like, like, I don't know. I don't. I don't Color blind judge. Yeah, you can't see decipher. You know, <laughs> a red corner, blue corner. You know. <laughs> I don't know. That makes it terrible, man. That yeah. makes it terrible. And then you get um, you got YouTube stars now that are getting into the boxing and then the MMA type stuff. Uh, I think that's fascinating too. Yeah. I think just it's it seems to me that we're in such an interesting time, especially in the growth of sports yeah. and MMA, boxing, wherever that lies. It seems like they're going to the influencer model. But with this pandemic era that we're in right now, the UFC really took a step up being the first professional sports organization mm-hmm. coming back, having professional fights, having having sports back. And it's put the UFC in such a unique position to kind of set the tone. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I was going with the uh, celebrity fights thing. Yeah. I, all of a sudden, I just thought of, uh, for some reason, I randomly thought of over at the UFC. I thought it was like Logan Paul with uh, Borashina. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. you, because you're always the, you're there I all the time. I wasn't there, but I saw the video, like, of getting which which video? Did you see Logan's side or Paulo's side? Because <laughs> one might be completely different. I don't know. I saw a couple, and now I'm seeing Francis is like boxing some 
Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for charity, he, right? Yeah, he's boxing yeah. for charity, and then I saw Poor him guy. taking the body shot. Yeah. <laughs> what, the, what, what is going on, man? That's, That's it. Not... The, what is going on with this? <laughs> I don't know. It's a crazy, crazy times we're in. So well, unique. You brought up Paulo. What do you think about his upcoming fight against Israel? I don't know. That's a fun, exciting, interesting bout. Um, I don't know. I uh, Israel is such a you know tactical technician. He sees everything. Uh, he's I wouldn't say he's a, a KO artist, but he's just like like he's a sniper for sure. But um, Costa can knock you out from anywhere, and he's just got tremendous size and and uh, but I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting. Just watching Costa and Yoel, that was a crazy fight. And I got to see that live, and I was really impressed by him. Um, I don't know. I, I can't even make a pick for that one. It's kind of what does Paulo walk around at? So I I have a, a good relationship with uh, Coach Erica Barasin and and Henry and stuff, and I know they're down in Brazil. Paulo, uh, when he was on our podcast, was two hundred fifty pounds. Wow. Right now, I believe he's two hundred and thirty five pounds. That's so insane. a 230, I mean, this guy could fight at heavyweight if he wanted to. Yeah. And he's cutting all that weight to 185. I mean, it's going to be insane. I think I've seen something like the commission release, like the fight night weights. So yeah. like you weigh in 185 and then they weigh you again, be like fight night. Right. And then they release that. And I think Costa was like, don't quote me 100%, but I think he was at least like 226, maybe more. Yeah, I remember it was like, yeah, I think they went by like body weight percent. Or they, it was some sort of percentage and he was significantly more. Yeah. But doesn't that vary by commission? And I don't know what the rules are in Abu Dhabi, um, if that's where the fight. Yeah. They, they still haven't announced it yet. I don't think yet, there's but, rules. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't know if there's any rules. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, another one, though, too, because of just the, the close-knit relationships. What what do you make of the, the Mike Tyson celebrity boxing fight against uh, Roy Jones Jr.? Is Roy even going to fight him still? Is I'm hearing rumors that Evander Holyfield could step up. Yeah, I don't know. For me, honestly, that's kind of it makes me sad. Like, I mean, he can do what he wants to do. They can both, you know, Mike Tyson, Roy Jones. Like, but they don't have to prove themselves. But I get it. Like, you know, we want to make money. Like, they're going to make a lot of money doing so. It's just sad for me to see these guys who were like my idols. Like both of them, Roy Jones Jr. One of the best in the world. Mike Tyson was just an icon, just knocking everyone out. And I don't know. I don't want to see it, to be honest. It's kind of sad. Do you but think, then some part of me wants to see it. <laughs> but do you think a lot of fighters don't know when they should hang it up? Um, I think that's something you got to kind of come to realization with yourself. Like, like, I try to make that decision now. Like, maybe I have, you know, seven years. Seven, six, seven solid years, but you gotta have a, you know, a deadline because you're always gonna get to that wherever for if you're forty or forty, whatever it is, you know, and then be like, oh, I got one more in me. Oh, I got. Oh, I lost. I don't want to end on a loss. Oh, I'm gonna t try again. Oh, I got knocked out again. Like you don't want to go down like that. So then, do you have kind of an ultimate end goal, like what you want to do with the sport and what you want to do in your life after the sport? Um, have you thought of that? A little bit. Yeah, obviously I want to be the I want to be a champion. That's my first and foremost goal in this sport, sport is to be the champion. Um and I have a lot of work to do. So I was getting close. I was on the rise, but you know, it's still right there. A couple fights, a couple good wins and then puts me right back there. Uh but, you know, after fighting, I haven't I so when I first came here, I never wanted to be a manager. The last I never even had that idea of being a manager i i went to school i studied nutrition sports physics kinesiology but i never you know got into business or any of that stuff but i've learned all that stuff and i can say right now i could be a really good manager i really think so and uh i feel like just the way things are going like with my career and then if i go into management i could be really successful because even up and comers Maybe they'll be like, hey, that, you know, this kid has really put in the work. He's fought at the highest level and he's learned from one of the best in the game. 
and I think I could be a great manager if I, I wanted to. Be. I can totally yeah, see it. Me too. I can totally see it. Just with the dynamics of your situation, learning from Ali and with Brian, and just the relationships mm -hmm. and your personality. Um, yeah. And I experience. Could see experience. Yeah. Yeah, man, you could you could definitely do that. I yeah. can see that. And that's what makes Ali a good good manager too, is because he has fought before. So we, and he he's experienced where maybe he wasn't the best fighter. And but then he didn't get the attention because he wasn't the best fighter. Like maybe I don't remember his manager at the time, but like he didn't get that attention. So he doesn't want he doesn't want his fighters to feel that way. Like he'll treat a low level regional guy the same as a Kamaru Usman. I've seen him and he'll have the same relationship and bond with him. That's what I see from a personal level that I think is pretty awesome. And that's how I would want to treat my fighters too if I ever became a manager myself. And that's the one thing I do notice about Ali. You know, everyone has their own opinions. Everybody, hit, there's some people that say some things, there's some people that say other things. But the one thing I see, the common thread, is between all the fighters. That everybody, not only does he represent some of the best talent in this game, it speaks for itself, those names, those yeah. champions are who they are, but everybody is like a brother to him yeah. that he works with. And they will yeah. literally take a sword for him, take a bullet for him, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something, some sort of brotherhood that he establishes yeah. um, that speaks for itself. And Definitely. you can't, that relationship is that relationship. I mean, you, you can't, you can't fake that. That's yeah. earned. Definitely. And that's why, you know, I still, that's why I'm still where I am today is, is because like I worked so hard to, you know, when I had nothing, I knew nobody when I came to Vegas. So like Ollie was one of the first guys I knew in Vegas and like he gave me a chance. So it's like, I'm still here. Like I want to help him. I've, I want to see that guy succeed, you know. Like I'm close with his kids, his family, and he treats me like family. So like I'll, I don't whatever people's opinions are about him. Those are just opinions, you know. I I base things off relationship and facts and just I don't know. <laughs> What's the biggest thing that you've learned from him so far? Uh, I don't know. Maybe just maybe loyalty. Like, I, loyalty is very important in this business. And there's times where you have to, like, distance yourself. But I feel like it's very important. Like, being loyal to your coaches. Um, a lot of guys, maybe they'll lose once and they want to go find a new gym or something. Like, or they uh, their manager did something, so they want to jump ship to a new management. Like, stay loyal. That's why I'm with Brian. Like, I stay loyal. I love Brian. We talk, you know, we talk consistently. Even though I could technically manage myself you know through ollie or whatever you know i can make decisions as a man on my own but it's good to have that barrier you know I, i'm the fighter you know i have a manager i work with the manager um but just being loyal to your people have a close circle you know don't try to you know spread yourself out too far so keeping a tight circle has been big and you know less stressful in my life uh, but that's probably some of the few things for sure. Yeah, what I noticed uh, with the Schmo character, um, when I came more into covering MMA and boxing from the NFL and NBA side, I didn't realize how many dynamics there were with the different managers and, you know, how, how things were, you know, territorial things could get. But I just, I, I, the part I just don't like the most is just I feel like instead of bringing everyone up together this is the fastest growing sport in mm -hmm. the world mm -hmm. there's people out there trying to tear each other down and yeah. and that to me is the only really negative thing i felt in this sport and i just wish could get better over time and i don't know the answer to that i have no yeah. solution to that i just i wish everyone could find the same common goal and get there but i just know there's probably managers out there that have jealousy try mm -hmm. to take fighters from other fi uh from yeah. other managers and all that kind of stuff it's just I don't know the solution to that. I just want to see this this sport grow and prosper to be on the level of the NFL, the NBA, yeah, and you name it from there. Oh, for sure. And I think it really comes down to just being yourself. Um, you know, you have a great persona. Like that's you. You know, don't no one made you into that. That's you. And like, got a lot of guys want to go the Connor route because he was very successful at it. And then that's when like a lot of the trash talking began. But I'm. I'm not like a trash talker, but I like to, you know, I'll talk a little bit, but I'm just a realist and I try to do 
most of my impressions with my fighting. That's why I fight the way I fight. And I, you know, I put it on the line and I go out and just get after it. And I feel like, and then I'm a, still a, a humble human, genuine human being after even in a loss or a win. Like I try to, you know, not change or let anything change me. And I know they want, they want to promote and this and that. And we could still promote. Like there's, there's guys out there who don't, we don't have to talk trash and we can still be a star. Like George St. Pierre doesn't talk any trash. He's one of the biggest stars in the sport and he's not even fighting, but um, he's a movie star too. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. Be yourself. Hey, and Habib versus GSP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At 155. If, if, if he gets the job done against Justin Gaethje. And that's a big, if. yeah. Uh, that would really, I think that would close out his legacy. You know, if he gets past Gagey. Um, I know that was one of his father's goals and, you know, something for him was to retire at 30, you know. And I think he wants to, that's what he, he's always wanted to fight George St. Pierre because he's one of the greatest of all time. And uh, some people can consider him the number one great, you know, the GOAT. Would the winner of that fight be the GOAT? You have to be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like that's a pretty damn good way to close out this uh, this podcast right yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. Um, any final thoughts from the Danimal, uh, the 50K Ige, the Dynamite Dan? <laughs> I mean, man of many nicknames. I don't know. Well, just thank you for having me. Like, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but this is my first time on a live podcast. So thank you guys. Thanks for having me. Um, wasn't too nervous. <laughs> Pop in the cherry, the first of many to come. Because you've done podcasts before, but through like Zoom or Skype and yeah, that type yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interviews and never sat down in a studio. So it was cool. Cool experience. Appreciate having you in the schmo zone. Heck yeah. Final thoughts, Helen? Um, just thank you so much for yeah. coming in studio. We really appreciate it. And yeah. like we've mentioned before, we love watching your fight. So hopefully in December, and if it is here in Las Vegas, because I know you mentioned, yeah. you know, you haven't fought Please. on like <laughs> a card uh, in <laughs> Las Vegas yet. But thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Episode 30 of the Schmo Zone podcast. We're out. Mm -hmm.